Hey, what's going on, Storm Watchers? Um, yeah, as I promised, or probably like, you know, made a note to myself somewhere in the past, uh, I was going to be doing a review on uh, Rhea and the Last Dragon and whatnot, because I just saw it like, well, four weeks ago, and I meant to do a review later on it, but, you know, of course, I, uh, well, honestly, I just never got around to it, and sometimes I just didn't fucking feel like it. Like I, I, I'm not even gonna beat, beat around the bush with this. Like uh, I'm, I'm, I'm coming out as blunt and as earnest as I am with why I didn't do it recently. I mean, I, I should have done it. I shouldn't have done it earlier, but you know, yeah, I just didn't get around to it. But you know, I'm finally, go, I'm finally gonna do this shit and whatnot. You know, talk about this film and, and what's going on with it, what I like, what I didn't like, and, you know, the in and out. Y'all already know the drill on this channel, when, when I, how I do things and whatnot. Okay, the, the basic plot of this film is pretty much your typical, you know, kind of end of the world, you know, do this, do that before this and that happens and whatnot, you know. Okay, pretty much it starts off kind of like Avatar, being in this fictional, Asianic, you know, world going on. And pretty much it's a time of where everyone's literally gung-ho, no pun intended, everyone's literally gung-ho on uh, kicking off war with each other over the possession of this mystical jewel that essentially holds back this... Uh, sinister, sentient, uh, negative energy that turns anything in its path into stone, uh, Medusa style. And pretty much the main kingdom that this story focuses on, that Rhea, the main character, happens to uh, originate from, pretty much was in possession of this uh, jewel, her little kingdom. And pretty much... The snow kingdom and the, the the water kingdom and the desert kingdom and the emo haircut kingdom pretty much wanted the jewel for themselves to more or less in, the, in some way benefit their own sanctions, which, you know, is supposed to paint, you know, the, 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 the essential main antagonists of this film and the emo haircut kingdom, you know, as the more morally gray you know, characters of this uh, movie, but pretty much that kind of more or less falls downhill a bit in this movie, which I'll get into later. I mean, people uh, kind of get mad when you do spoilers, but uh, I thought people would have been kind of known that by now as soon as, you know, I was given the basic synopsis of this film. So anyway, Rhea, as a kid, more or less the main character we see throughout the movie, Pretty much uh, plays with the emo haircut kingdom uh, uh, named Kermanda uh, around the kingdom and whatnot. And she uh, was stupid. And, uh, 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 Kelly Marie Tran's character, Rhea, yeah, Kelly Marie Tran uh, plays uh, the main character, Rhea. Uh, Ke uh, uh, Rhea pretty much was stupid enough. To very much show the emo haircut girl, Kermanda, you know, the, the world jewel that kept the evil purple goo away. She, she, reluct, she reluctantly showed her it like an idiot, despite, you know, being told the diagnosis was going on in her world. And pretty much in a feud, of course, to be expected, uh, the emo haircut girl with a feud of other people trying to get possession of it, breaks it, and the goo comes out, and most of the, uh, and most of, uh, Rhea's, uh, kingdom is affected, and plenty others around the world, and pretty much, it's pretty much the, and, 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 like, the movie fast forwards, like, eight more years prior from this incident, El Yair Fopper is played by Daniel Ray Kelm, and he's, uh, you know, turned into stone. And pretty much, literally, give or take eight or ten years apart from that event, the main character, Rhea, has to 
you know, find all the Jewish shards. Because uh, I guess this movie turned into uh, Inuyasha. As they get all the jewel shards to more or less put the goo back and bring back everyone who was turned into stone. And pretty much, and that's pretty much like the basic synopsis of the film. If I'm going to have to, if, if I'm going to have to like give a really astute and, and skeptic view of this film, I'm going to actually have to start off with really just the story in general. I mean, like again, like I said at the beginning, it's your basic, you know, do this, do that, look for here, look for her, look for that thing, put that thing here, you know, to prevent this from that from happening. Kind of like Ezric. <laughs> yeah, if anyone gets that, that game, yet, you're officially old. But it's pretty much that same uh, plot. You know, the whole journey, find this, find that, you know, type story going on. And for either way, that could be really good. Or really generic for some people, or preferable. So yeah, it, it cuts both ways on that concept. Um, I mean, if I had to talk about anything, the tone is pretty consistent. As soon as uh, Aquafina's character, Hisu, the last dragon, as it says in the title, as soon as she comes in, it kind of the tone kind of gets a little squat, kind of gets a little lost so to speak, like, this is a really dire thing that's going to happen, like, you know, the whole world is going to end, and, you know, the whole world's going to end, and, you know, the, the whole world's on the brink of war with each other for the possession of it, like, you expect it to be, this film to be a bit more grim, and in terms of tone, that's pretty much my only real uh, thing I had about this movie, like, the tone was, wasn't consistent enough, and at the same time, the, the the tone they also decided to use in this film didn't match. Like, this film should be kind of a bit more grim, but for the most of the part, it's kind of bombarded with just really flat comedy, even for, you know, kids' sake. Because, you know, we all assume that, you know, kids had to be too stupid to understand things. And, you know, we, we got to act like they're all negligent and stupid. So we got to give them any schlock. Despite these people might be are essentially the ones who are carrying the torch of the, of our community, but you know we still gotta treat kids like they don't know shit. Like we can't deal with heavy topics because of the uh, our audience we're giving it to. Like like it even makes a difference, which is really one of my biggest problems. Which kind of you know correlates with the tone of this film, the the social stigma where we think all oh, because a movie is for a kid is for kids. It has to be stupid or nonsensical or, or, you know, it doesn't have to make sense or it doesn't have to deal with certain, you know, topics that, you know, can happen in a child's life, like uh, death of a loved one, you know, something, you know, I personally went through and hundreds of kids, you know, probably go through, which with well, this film kind of really does really badly in my case. I mean, I know that's really redundant, you know, the whole how this movie really doesn't do consequences and it really tells a really vague, it tells a really vague and bad message on death. But it's so fucking true in this film, and it has to be said. And, of course, it correlates with the whole tone kind of being really tongue-in-cheek, despite of, you know, the, the, the subject of the theme, the subject of matter in this. And, quite frankly, I just felt like it wasn't consistent enough. That's pretty much what I got to say about, like, the tone of just the story alone. Uh... The characters themselves, I mean, Rhea, she's fine. I mean, I would I, I would just throw, I mean, if she was someone else, like, if she was, like, Captain Marvel or someone, I just would have thrown the, 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 uh, the term strong female character. And, yeah, she rightfully is. But, really, some people find her underwhelming. Me, personally, I feel like she... She she does the job well enough. She's kind of like uh, the main character from Quest of Camelot, but you know she's not just. I want to do what a boy want to do. Like no, like Ray actually legitimately does seem like, you know, a, in, like a character that can stand up on her two feet, and she's not boggled down by just one concept. Like her father and her whole people were turned into stone from the goop. And, you know, that would actually really inspire her to, like, 
want to do the best to return everything back. It, it does seem like something integral to her character and not simply some just to push the message or just to simply just provocate a really limp and, and, and repetitive character uh, arc that you can simply make for any character. They're strong. They're, they're independent. They want to be like the boys or girls. And if whatever, you know, movie you're looking at, simply because they are. Like, that's apparently just being strong is, is treated more so as a character trait opposed to... Uh, it's, it's treated as character, personality, opposed to just being a trait. And Rhea is not one of them. She's not just a strong female character because she has to be. Like, her strong female characterness actually does correlate with her character in this film. One of the most of the things she go through. I mean, sometimes, yeah, she can be kind of irritable, especially how Kelly kind of gives off most of the dialogue in this film. But but for the most part, it was, it's decent enough. She she gets the job done. She does fit the scenario enough. Again, it's, I'm just harking back on the whole tone uh, concept of this film that just really doesn't do it for me. And it just seems kind of too inconsistent at times. And it seems too lenient on more or less the comical part than you know, the really more dire, you know, atmosphere this film was given off at first, which I kind of, which also kind of really reminded me a lot of Mulan. I'm like, a movie like this, like the tone and the subject matter it has, it should be a bit more, it, it should be treated more with, uh, with, a, with a bit more, what's the word I'm looking for? It should be treated more with a bit more respect, for lack of better words given the subject matter of this, you know, kind of somewhat being a war drama fantasy going on. So, yeah, there's that. And, uh, pretty much, that's all I, that's really I gotta say about Rhea. She's not, I don't dislike her, and she's not boggled, boggled down simply just being strong female character. Like, she's not a Mar- Mare Sue. Mare Sue, she's, actually does seem to, you know, she actually do seem plausible. Not everything's given to her. Yeah, things are kind of convenient, but, you know, you can say that for, like, hundreds of stories that doesn't have a female character. But, so, for the most part, she do fits, you know, the whole status better, for the most part. And she's just not boggled down by that one trait. That's pretty much what I got to say about the main character in general. Hisu, uh, uh, Aquafina's character, the last dragon, is kind of where the whole characterization thing kind of tips over for me. Hisu is apparently the last dragon. And in this world they live in, they're kind of, you know, revered as, you know, like saviors. Like, you know, the, they're, they're like water sprites. Everyone needs water. You know, it's kind of an essential thing everyone needs. And you would think, you know, she would be kind of more... I mean, I guess they try to be more subvertive. Uh, subversive. Like, you know, <laughs> subverted. Subversive. They try to make, you know, seem more subversive. You know, the whole wise guru character or, you know, uh, a person in the series, you know, should be no nonsense and serious and doesn't, you know, bust a gut or anything. I mean, I think that's what they were trying to be with Hisu. Like, they, they were trying to subvert from that concept. But I just feel like the comedy, I just feel like her simply just being really the, the comical relief. Because this film has, like, quite frankly, three of them. Uh, I think one comical uh, relief character is way more than enough. If everyone's a comical relief character, then it kind of kills the whole purpose. Unless you know, this particular show or movie, book, fill in the blank, is uh, humorous, but the way Rhea goes, it's not, but more or less the whole com- the comedy tone kind of really, it suffocates everything, which of course harkens back to the whole tone in this film. It's just really just one of my really pet peeves about this film that I wish they just really... I really wish they just adequately handled better than what they did in this film. 
Hisu, you know, yeah, supposed to be subvert from the old monk guru, you know, a thousand year character. I've known this for many years, you know, type character. They, I see where they were trying to be subversive, sub, subversive with Hisu, but I just feel like her comical moments really, again, are just another aspect of the film in terms of tone that just gets in the way of everything. Like, I was, I'm not asking her to be serious. I mean, yeah, I, I think they were trying to be subversive with her, but I just feel like she was just, again, boggled down to just being another gag, a hardy, hardy, hard character for the kids, and it kind of really ruined that, you know, the whole lore behind the dragons and their importance, because she kind of virtually really doesn't do anything in this film, be honest, which really kind of sh uh, shows the importance of these dragons they have in this world and whatnot from what this how this movie established it. Uh, so, yeah, there's that about Hisu. Like, she's really a loving and leave it character. You know, she makes kind of crude humor. Oh, my God. Uh, I can turn into a human. Oh, my head can reach my butt. Like, you know, like just dumb, hearty, hard comedy for kids that, yeah, okay. Yeah, sure, kid audience. But really, when this, this movie really explains the importance of, you know, that these beasts have on, you know, their overall economy and their way of traveling and their ecosystem and geography, you know, kind of one of the bare basic principles of world building, which is something I'll also get into later. And I just felt with, with Hisu, Aquafina's character, they just really, really missed the mark. And quite frankly, they kind of just really forgot, you know, how important that they're supposed to be in this film. I guess the writers are like, fuck it at this point. I'm doing a lot of squinting today. <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, that's what I got to say about Hisu. Uh, the, the boat boy, he's fine, I guess. Again, you know, too many comedy relief characters in the show. The the, the baby and the, and, and the monkey characters, again, just another pointless comedy relief characters that really don't add anything to this film and could have, if they were written out, it wouldn't have made any difference. And then we got the the the, the uh, we we got the Mongolian like uh, character in this movie. Who's when we go to the snow place of the movie, the snow setting of the movie. Again, I'll go. I will literally go back to. I will go to world build. I will go to town to world building in this film eventually. So yeah, we got more or less the 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 the, the, the fellowship, so to speak. Yeah, we got the fellowship of this film. They're Kind of established in some way, although I think the uh, snow guy, he was kind of like given a hand wave in this film. And really, I mean, the fact that he still kind of seemed to be, he was kind of an idiot. I mean, the way the movie, you know, handled the snow guy, he was just kind of an idiot. Like, you know, he tried to be, you know, all serious. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, I'm tough, I'm rough, but really he's kind of of a of a subdued softy who essentially can't just like Rayla Raya no not Dragon Prince. Raya, just like Raya, he essentially lost his whole country and his uh, wife and child. And again, you would think, you know, that character would be again taken with a bit more respect in the year. Like his tone would be kind of more aligned, it would be more appropriate. But again he's just you know, a gentle giant, but he's kind of a doofus. And again, if he wasn't in this film, it wouldn't have really done. It would really wouldn't affect anything. Which I see what they were trying to do with their whole fellowship, so to speak. What they try to do is the the message of the film, you know, about coming together, you know, ending all bullshit, you know, ending you know ties and just living together as one kingdom. As you know, the the whole message of this film was trying to put out, but I guess he just didn't, I guess the writers midway just decided, fuck it. They're trying to say that, you know, this is a problem we all have to face at the end, especially when emo haircut, yeah, someone gave me this for the integrity of this uh, video. <clears throat> oh, shit. And it's an old McDonald's toy. I guess someone kind of felt the same way about me with uh, this character and no overall theme of the film as I did. This character, 
emo. You know, at the end, yes, yeah, spoilers. She, you know, helps the good guys. You know, the whole antagonist they were setting up from the beginning of the film, you know, when she was trying to literally capture her throughout the whole film. You know, yeah, she, she, she essentially, yeah, I'm pretty much using this for like a prop of the video. So, you expect it to, you know, me just waving it in the video and whatnot. Yeah, camera's inverted, but yeah. Yeah, pretty much, yeah, at the end, even she kind of, you know, joins the fellowship in certain way. You know, she kind of serves a, a thing in this film, but it really doesn't matter at the end because it essentially just felt like the film just did a 180 on this character. And, and you know, in terms of, you know, her motives and whatnot, they essentially made a moral great character and essentially just a eager psychopath who, yes, what would do anything to save her kingdom, even means, you know, killing the titular character. But it just doesn't mean anything in the long run. That's kind of the whole problem with this film in general. Uh, actually, this whole movie in general, this whole movie in general, it feels like, it feels like fantasy novels, like a series of fantasy novels, more or less summarized, in one story. Yeah, I'm getting Dark Tower vibes here. Uh, Aragon vibes here. It seems like, yeah, one... It, it seems like a series of fantasy novels summarizing one. Especially how they express, you know, the world and all this. And whatnot. You know, the world of this, which I'm finally gonna get into. You know what I'm saying? And all that. But yeah, it's just... It's my problem with most of the characters. They're all... Boggled down by, by, they're all boggled down by, by few personalities. They all don't seem really too indifferent. Uh, they, they don't seem too different, I meant, from each other. Most of them, like, again, are just comedy relief really characters or just really humorous characters that, again, really deters the whole tone of this movie that they were going for. And pretty much, yeah, that's, that's what I gotta say about the aspect of characters. Even with uh, Kermanda, Kermanda here. It's just, it, these characters just don't, it, it's kind of like if you would have put Luffy in Attack on Titan. These characters just don't fit the tone. Like, okay, you want to have a comic relief character, that's fine. Comic relief characters, well, as it suggests, they, they bring relief to a story. They help it breathe. They help, they let it, comic relief characters let helps the story subside it you know keeps it keeps another tone it, it doesn't it keeps you from getting bored or boggled down from like the misery of the film in this and i just feel like where there's too many of it the tone is just so deterred and derailed it just goes in another direction and it just seems like another dumb kitty movie it's been, instead of the real potential this movie could have had like Disney is so eager of trying to like find something new instead of making all these godforsaken uh, uh live actions out here. But every time they do try to do something new, they kind of just spoil it. They 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 ruin it by just balking down just another hardy hard dumb dumb kids film. And that's just really what this movie suffers from. In, in terms of the whole character, in, in terms of uh character dynamics and, and situations. Like, like, if if I would have wrote this film, Raya, Raya, Hisu, uh, Raya Hisu, Mongolian guy, snow guy, Raya Hisu, snow guy, should have been serious. They they should have been, you know, like serious character because we kind of know the dilemma they were going through and you know Hisu's role and. You know, the whole restoration of this world they're in. Like, they should have legitimately actually been more uh, sincere and integral characters, in my opinion. The water boy, I guess he's fine. But, again, his style of comedy in this film, his, his, his use of a comic relief, too, also gets really overwhelming. Like, if it, it would be fine if he was, like, Puck from, like, Berserk. Like, here and there, you know, he kind of... He makes a quip here, or you know, essentially, if he was like a voice for the for the audience, then that's fine. 
And yeah, I guess you can add the baby and the monkey for like, you know, for the kid audience, which I feel like this is what the film was trying to do. But again, too many comic relief characters kind of really uh, derails his move off his tracks. The baby and the monkey, they could have been, you know, for the, the kid audience, you know, comic relief for the kids. The, the, the boat boy who pretty much travels throughout the world, he could have been, you know, more or less like the voice of the audience, you know, that type of comic relief character that, you know, sort of like, you know, what would we kind of, what would we think, you know, while watching this film? That would have been fine. I mean, this movie even has fart and bugs. I mean, it tries too hard to appeal to children, but they think just simply just being goofy and funny and really just tongue-in-cheek and just having a lot of really just juvenile jokes. They think, you know, this is what kids like. Uh, uh, Jack's supposed to, you know, actually just writing something that is legitimately good that kids would like. Like, I'm sorry, it's just the tone of this film. Really, really just put me out of it. And why I just thought it was just so average in the, in this accord. I mean, you know, I guess it's cool, you know, Asian representation and all that, but it's just the tone is, I keep saying it, but it's fucking me up. It's really, really got to me in this film. It was such a missed opportunity. It could have been dealt with so much better. It could have been so much more consistent. But this film just didn't do it in that accord. That's all I'm just saying on the whole tone. I, I, it's going to be the death of me, but yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, I kept fucking yapping about it. The world building in this is fine, I guess. The world building in this was fine. But it's just really undeveloped. Like, in terms of when, when I mean, like, the world building in here is decent. It's like, you know, there's everything about these worlds that do, you know, that, that distinguish them. Like, you know, their clothing or even how some sex are, like, brown or some people are light-skinned. Like, you know, it really does reflect their, their skin color, really does reflect the geography they're in. Like, you know, the color of their, their, their clothing or, you know, the way they do things, you know. You know, the simple, basic, world-building, one-on-one, you know, babble that this film does in terms of appearance, but literally drops the ball with everything else in terms of, in this film. Like, it just felt like, okay, more or less the whole movie is just them more or less going to each world and finding a gem piece. And the thing is, it's just, it, the movie literally itself tells you like, boom, this is yada, yada, yada. Like, in text, like, as soon as they get there. Like, it's just literally text. Like, that just tells you everything. Instead of, you know, natural world building where, you know, show don't tell. Like, yeah, sure, exposition is fine to kind of give you a basic idea of the setting. But this film literally has to openly tell you in, in, in large text before the characters themselves actually get there. The only time the world, like again, the only time this world building is actually good is in terms of how, you know, each, each, you know, country does look, you know, they do look different. Like you can actually distinguish them. They do look different, like from apart from each other. But it's just, it's, it's more superficial. It's more, from what you see, like, let's take Avatar for appearance, like, I mean, uh, for example, like, yeah, okay, the Earth Kingdom and is, is obviously uh, Imperial China, uh, the Air Nomads are Tibetan, uh, Southeast Asian, just like what this film is, the Fire Nation are Imperialistic Jap Japan, and the uh, Waterbenders of our, our Inu, Native Americans, like, but, it, and, you know, they physically all look the same, even their hairstyles and colors and, you know, whatnot, how they look and, and all that. But there's still key things about all these different nations that tell them apart, like from how they do things, like 
the Fire Nation has a top-notch Navy. The Earthbenders are kind of more straightforward to combat. You know, they some of them don't even wear shoes because some Earthbenders literally can read tremble, uh, uh, can can really can read quakes through their feet. And the Waterbenders are kind of their government. They're really tribalistic. The the Fire Nation is uh, a monarchy. The Earth Kingdom's a monarchy. The Air Nation are more nomadic. They have gurus opposed to the Fire Nation and the Earth Nation having kings and the Water Nation having tribes. Like they like they actually feel like like these world the Avatar worlds. There was enough time to go into them to tell you how different these worlds are to really establish world building. Like yeah, you can tell the difference. And it wasn't simply just based on a superficial aspect. It was, they actually went into more like the meat and potatoes of each world. And some people may say, well, it's like a one, it's like a one hour movie. They can't, you know, detail everything. But I'm like, uh, this movie is able to literally go to a point A and point B and tell you just the gist of the story. I think they can't have enough time to tell you a bit more about these worlds aside from a more aesthetic feel or, you know, what was told from the narrator or what's told from other characters. Like, that just sounds like a really bad excuse of why these worlds are just so undeveloped in terms of, you know, the essential themes of what makes a world in the story, you know, adequate world building. I mean, hell, even Bleach is another good example. I mean, got Waco Mundo and, and the Soul Society, the... So society that are based on more feudal Japan, you know, it's mostly samurais and whatnot. Uh, their government is obviously uh, really uh, feu- textbook feudalism. There's even, you know, like, there's even like a bourgeoisie in the soul society. There's the nobles and to, to Rukon, which are pretty much peasants' uh, uh, souls. Or how in Hueco Mundo, pretty much it's almost Darwin. Is, is it's a sense of Darwinism, like everything kind of goes, and more or less Taikubo really uh, detail. Uh, he really showed that by pretty much making most of the wrong cars and hollows resemble animals, you know, like in Darwinism, you know, natural selection, everything kind of goes. The, the 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 weak dies and the strong keeps living. They have to feed on each other. Uh, it's kind of more tribalistic even with uh, when, we, when we show Baragon. Like, essentially, he got there simply for just being powerful. Aside from, you know, the usual way you'll become a king through, you know, being anointed or through bloodline. Like, well, when people say Bleach has bad world building, I really just... I, I roll my eyes so hard I can see my fucking brain because... Essentially, it is pretty adequate world building. And again, it's not based on an aesthetic film. Uh, not what Grand Line Review's horrible uh, review on Bleach would tell you. It kind of goes beyond from how it looks. Like, that was a really terrible review. I mean, he made, you know, he made some points here and there, but that was terrible. But I'm hearing off, you know, from, you know, Ray in the Last Dragon review. I'm just throwing an example about... I wouldn't say expert, but at least, you know, adequate enough world building. And on the aesthetic level, Rhea, it shines, but in terms of, like, internal themes, it falls to fucking pieces. And it could have really been flushed out more. Maybe if this film was kind of more of, like, a sort of trilogy, like, each world they go to is kind of, like, condensed in its own film or something, like... Like, again, it just harkens back to this just feeling like a, a, fan, a an adapted fantasy novel series summarized in one book. I mean, Disney's so, they're, they're so, they, they want to do something different, but I feel like they're not really putting their whole foot into this. And that's where this movie falls apart. Kind of just like the, how the ending falls apart in terms of the message, in terms of the whole uh, bleak factor and, you know, the whole consequences in this. Like, you know, the fact that literally almost 80-some percent of the world was covered in stone, but as soon as, you know, the g- the gym is repaired, all the dragons come back, and everyone's restored, despite, you know, 
the stone statues usually deteriorate, so uh, that will kind of also mean that a lot of people are dead at the same time. Um, I mean, it's just like, yeah. I mean, that's pretty much what I gotta say about like the essential things about this film. I mean, the animation is just like any other Disney movie. Some people say it's like the best it's ever been, but I'm like, uh, it's okay. Like, for a while when I saw the trailers, I didn't even think this was a Disney movie. I thought it was one of those really good animated Hong Kong films. But the story doesn't really make sense and the dubbing is awful. But, you know, it just looks really pretty. And that's essentially what this film is. If I didn't even see the Disney logo, if I didn't even essentially saw the Disney logo, I wouldn't even tell that this movie was a Disney movie. I just would have assumed it was just one of those really pretty looking Chinese animated movies. And that's kind of, that's literally the thing. Like, this, this seems like it could have really gone, it really could have gone somewhere, but Disney simply just, I guess, didn't have the balls enough to really, you know, go full force with it. It was boggled down by the a really haphazard tone. And it really uh, deceives the whole message this film was going going with at first. It's just, mm, it's just so much holding this film back. And that's why I just had to give it an adequate, ad, uh, not inadequate, adequate. I know uh, my whole list, you know, going on here. It's adequate. Like, I feel like this movie, it was holding itself back. Opposed to, you know, what the studio couldn't do for it. Like, this movie should have really went, it should have really let go on it. You know, it should have really, it, it, it's like how I feel about Mulan. It really should have went somewhere. I feel like it was, it was too stapled down by, you know, by really haphazard comedy characters and, and a really inconsistent tone and really the message more or less pulling it, uh, 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 getting pulled under its feet. In this, and I had to give it an adequate, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I was really looking forward to this too, but again, just boggled down just by more or less really just kind of bad pacing that feels like you're on pixie sticks and cocaine and, and five hour energy energy drinks and venom energy drinks and monsters it's just the, the pacing it just feels like it goes from one place to another and you barely even actually kind of grasp it and the film itself kind of almost treats it like it's not important i mean i really want to like this film but i just feel like I feel, like again it should have this film should have like been like its own franchise it should have you know started slow by establishing was going on first, like, you know, with Reyes World, you know. I mean, they did an excellent job on, like, giving you a basic gist of what's going on, but that's literally only as far as this movie goes in terms of, you know, setting everything up. And so, yeah, I'm going to have to give it a adequate, somewhat creeping into, uh, uh, damn. It's just, yeah, this movie kind of, it, it, it really puts me out. So y'all, y'all already know the drill. Like, subscribe, and comment what y'all felt like, and all that. I mean, I, I know I'm feeling a bit more kind of morbid and <laughs> about in this one, but it just, just really shows just how Disney is capable of doing good with you know the writers and staff they have, or or the writer staff they're able to pay off. Uh, let's be honest. I mean, I don't think anyone within Disney has a creative bone in their body, unless if they're just like you know, buying writers or animators or, or artists. <laughs> Disney could have went somewhere with this, but I feel like they just only put their toe in the in in hot water and decided to not go in it. You know, when you're about to take a bath. And that, that's pretty much, yeah, that's it about it. Like and subscribe. Comment down below what you think. Like always, man, the, the Out of Storm is watching, y'all.